and it is a particular pleasure to be asked to introduce Dr. Rebecca Whittington. Uh, um, Dr. Whittington is um, one of the more extraordinary scholars to come out of this university. She is um, a comparativist. She is um, uh, a scholar of translation kind of language. Uh, she is in the deepest sense a philologist. Um, and she thinks in her work about questions of difference, uh, hierarchy, um, and um, in every sense the political through um, the ways in which uh, language and literature and hippie modernism come to work. Um, her PhD was entitled uh, Tagavir, the play of dialect in modern Bengali and Tamil literature. Um, uh, much of her work is focused upon uh, Bangla and Tamil. She also uh, is trained in and thinks about literature and pedagogy in Hindi and Urdu. Um, and I'm going to read from uh, her own description because I want to adjust this otherwise. Uh, Tagavir explores the generative role of non standard and everyday speech forms associated with marginalized communities, minorities, and women in the construction of literary modernism and contemporary movements in Bengali and Tamil literature. It was chaired uh, by George Hart with Raka Ray, Sylvia T. Wan, and Michael Masuj. Um, she did a, a master's thesis called Grasshopper Kebabs, The Problem of Language and the Fiction of Shiva Chivananda Das. Um, and um, she is uh, about to leave on uh, a Fulbright uh, both to uh, work and further work in, in Bengal and, and in uh, South India. The, um, her dissertation won the 2019 Nisarda Patel Award, which is for the, it's either the best dissertation in South Asian studies in the whole US or the whole world. It's modern India. Okay, the best dissertation <laughs> of modern India, <laughs> but it's the whole world, can you say, or is it? Uh, that I don't know. Okay, what's Probably say? US. Why not? Okay. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. UCLA makes claims like this. It's LA. Uh, it's the best dissertation in the cosmos. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, um, and a, a, an article is coming out um, uh, on it. And she's also written and translated and thought about translation. Uh, she was central translator <coughs> and editor for the anthology Time will write a song for you, contemporary Tamil writing from Sri Lanka. <coughs> Um, and she has a range of projects of translation. Um, with no further note, it's a pleasure to welcome the Thank you. Um, so, first of all, thank you, Lawrence, for the introduction and um, for uh, for moderating today. Um, and uh, a big thanks to Roya for. Um, making everything happen, and um, also to Muniz and Bonita and uh, Sanchita everyone at the center, which is, sorry, institute, I stand corrected. Institute, I've been here too long. Um, <laughs> uh, I got a lot of jokes about that at my graduation. Like, oh, so you've been here for a very long time. Yes, I know. Um, okay, so, uh, as you can see, I have chosen to use the same title for my talk as the dissertation uh, Tug of Ear, um, which is a phrase that I um, sort of uh, adapted, I guess you could say, from um, the work of Jivan on the Dash, who I worked on for my MA thesis and also in the dissertation, um, because it actually comes out of two different places in his work. There is a um, a line in the 1948 novel Madhulavan where the character um, describes in a very convoluted sort of passage, which I can only explain to you later, <laughs> that um, uh, he's being like tethered by his ears and pulled by his ears, um, expressing his sort of sense of frustration and alienation uh, uh, from his, um, not only from in his personal relationships, but also from his city and from his society. Um, and his language, and also from there's a poem where the uh, the 
subject of the poem is being pulled by dialectics in both yeah. directions by his ears. So one year is going this way, another year is going that way. But the reason I chose this phrase to describe dialect in particular is um, because of a, a common phrase, Gothar Tan, which literally means the pull of language, um, of the the pull of your home place on the way you speak, or the pull of your community on how you speak. So um, I wanted to convey the sense of play in um, in relation to dialect in both of these literatures, um, modern Bangla and Tamil, because um, I think that it is easy to associate socio-regional dialect with work, um, with, you know, for example, agricultural work or with um, many kinds of occupa uh, occupations that bring their own uh, terminology in, uh, into um, into play, but I wanted to to actually focus on the idea of play in um, in the way that writers engage with dialects in um, texts from roughly I was looking at from the um, the modernist period in the 1920s to 50s um, and up until today. So I worked on living writers um, as well as um, as modernist writers and some in between. So um, the picture you see here is um, a room from my daughter's dollhouse, actually, um, which <laughs> she's very <laughs> excited about that. Um, she also made me a really nice document holder for my documents. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, I like the way she she kind of combined these different elements in her dollhouse of the um, the Bengali pot paintings from the 19th century Calcutta and um, and also the piano and harmonium which we worked very hard to construct. So anyway, um, that's what you are seeing there in the picture. Um, so the dissertation fo uh, is is on. <laughs> <laughs> she, her, 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 that dollhouse was deconstructed and made into a Taj Mahal, so um, uh, she's a little upset about that. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the Taj Mahal was much harder to make out of cardboard boxes. Very difficult. Um, so I, um, I, chose to wrote, uh, I chose to write the dissertation on Bangla and Tamil together in a comparative framework because I think that it's something that isn't being done a lot in um, in modern literary scholarship in South Asia, um, and these two languages in particular have not been put in conversation very much. Um, you have some studies on Bangla and Hindi, or uh, you know Tamil and Malayalam, or uh, languages that are seen as being linguistically closely related. But um, but. I wanted to attempt something a little different with my um, comparative approach. Um, not only because these are the two languages that I um, have worked in the most, but also because I think they do speak to each other on some level, and um, the differences between them are also very interesting. So I divided um, the, uh, the work between um, different chapters that speak to each other through theme, not uh, not so much by historical period or relations between them, although there is a history of translation, um, particularly from Bengali into Tamil, um, but also recently more so um, in the other direction also. So I'm going to start with the uh, Bengali part um, in uh, and discussing the idea of Gotha. So, so Gotha is an ordinary word in Bangla. It's not like a, a, a fancy word or one that has a lot of um, a lot of um, baggage, but it's one that I found to be intensely productive in thinking about dialect, precisely because um, of its versatility, the way that it can be used to discuss many different um, aspects of dialect usage in um, in a literary text. So Kotha in some can be expressed as, as uh, um, the a verbal expression in, a, in uh, the presentation of, um, of thought in a verbal form um, that has an expectation of listening. So this is a weird translation of thought, right? It just, just means like talking. It's a normal word, right? But I 
chose to think of it that way because I think that it opened up a lot of um, interesting directions that I could take um, this work in. And um, I, in, I, in the, in the um, particularly in the in the second chapter of the dissertation, I ended up looking at Gotha in relation to date, which, um, as some of you will know, is is um, is a word for country, but also means many different things, as you see in this song, where it is pronounced as dash, right? So, uh, so this is a um, a song that uh, I think is most accurately categorized as Kirol, which is a kind of Hawaiya. It's a, a folk song from uh, North Bengal. Um, and the reason I chose to use this song, it's not actually quoted in one of the texts that I look at, but um, it is, uh, you can see sort of this um, sound play around the idea of dash, um, as well as kota um, in the song. So uh, briefly, the the Bengali-speaking region now comprises, you know, at least two countries besides everyone who doesn't live in those two countries who speaks Bangla. But within um, each of those uh, countries is many different regions with each with their own um, way of speaking, which is um, not does not have a conventional representation in literature. Uh, it is widely used, uh, the, the, the regional dialects are widely used in literature, but they're not um, conventionalized as a medium of, um, of literary expression. So um, in this song, the speaker is a woman who's um, longing for her absent lover, who is saying um, that he's gone to an upstream, gone upstream on the river, right? And that, um, uh, you know, people are talking about it, and she's she doesn't know what to say. So, um, I am just going to embarrass myself by singing the song <laughs> because I thought of like trying to do YouTube links, and that sounded like sounded like a bad idea because then you know techni technicalities mm -hmm. go wrong. So, it goes something like this. Tosha no di utale pata karbaha chole na Dari mon mor utale pata karbaha chole na Shona bondur bate re mon kamon kore gahore Tosha no di utale pata le. So this is the verse that's quoted here. Bontua mur bani is gay say, Hosahani yar dashi. Bontua mur bani is gay say, Hosahani yar dashi. Shina dashi, Purusha bada, Pari nari kashi. Nanan zoni de nanani kota shona hum. Nakam rao. So the reason I wanted to sing this song, even though it's embarrassing, is because um, what I found in looking at how these kind of songs are used in literary text is um, much more complex than it seems on the surface. For example, in the uh, in one of the novels I've, uh, I I read in the um, uh, is Quota uh, Maji, which is this one on the left. These are the original book covers, um, which they reprint them with the original book covers, so you can get them still in Kolkata now, um, with the the boats over there. So in Quota Maji, there is a Bhakti Ali song, which is a different form of, of river song. The one I just sang is a Bhavaiya. It comes from North Bengal, and it's about the Torshan uh, River in uh, the northern part of Bengal. Whereas Bhakti Ali is usually thought of as the songs, uh, the, they're often called boatsmen's songs, but they're, uh, they're actually s regionally specific. They're on the Podda, the Podda River and, um, and, uh, and other rivers in that area. So um, it's not so much the figure of the river or the boatman that is uh, regionally specific, but the melodic form and the um, the uh, pronunciation, the gaiety, the style of singing, 
that's different. So, um, you know, in my not very good rendition, you probably heard at least a little bit that there's some breaks in the voice. It's very um, sort of stylized kind of singing. Whereas in Bodana di Magi, they used a pariyali, which is a different uh, uh, form, which is actually not quoted in the text, which I found very interesting. The comment that the narrator makes is, Baro Shahad Gan not. It's not an easy song. So, um, in in uh, in the same uh, novel, there is a character who knows how to compose songs. So in um, the phrase is given in the dialect of the region as Gahan Bainta, which um, is a, it's a phrase that's used also in standard Ramla, but um, this is the dialectal pronunciation, um, which literally means to tie a song, mm -hmm. right, to compose it, to build it or put it together, um, which he does muke muke in his mouth, right, like orally. Um, and this is uh, central to the, the construction of this character who has immense um, charisma in the fisherman community that the novel is about because he has um, such a command of their colloquial forms of everything from conversation to knowing how to sort of manipulate a gathering of people to get them to, um, to avoid repercussions for his actions which are affecting the community as well as uh, forms like uh, this song which he makes um, I can uh, read it later if anyone's interested I have it here um, but the other uh, the other form that's important in this novel is the rukkata or uh, basically fairy tale but the literal translation would be something like form a story so in this um, in thinking about the role of Gotha, I wanted to think about different forms of narrative that are coming into the novel, um, or in some cases, short stories, um, or even poems in the later chapter, where um, the dialect is not just material. It's not just like uh, something that can be, uh, you know, snatched and put on the page for to represent a certain community or a certain uh, you know type of person. It's not just an ideology, or a, or even um, you know, or even a community. It's actually full of forms. There's all these forms in each dialect that are coming into the the narrative, right? So um, so Kota also has that element of narrative, right? So um, there's many different kinds of Kota. There's root Kota. There's upo Kota, which is in um, is the name of a uh, another novel that I looked at, which is um, literally sub story, like a folk tale. Um, and in the middle one, which you see there, the word used for story is porosta, which literally means a proposal. Like, so I'm going to tell you this, right? And with the expectation there's going to be an exchange of stories. So there actually is an exchange of stories. Because the uh, the narrator, who is using the formal literary variety of Bangla, called Shadhu um, is is narrating this episode, which he labels with a kind of um, uh, a kind of old-fashioned marker. It's called the Pravas Kondo. So it's like a segment of a narrative. Um, he tells this story, and then the women are making. Uh, Tape, just kind of like rice cakes, uh, and they're exchanging stories, parasta. So one woman offers to tell a story, but she doesn't know how to tell a story. So the other women are frustrated, they're like, you can't tell a story. And she keeps saying, Janina, I don't know. So then the other woman says, Ami Jan, I know, Kintu, Polvana, Kintu, Komuna, is how it, it appears in the dialogue. Then the, the, uh, the narrator sort of translates it into. Uh, you know, transform, transposes it, it into Shadu Basha in the narration. She says, I know, but I won't tell. So they have the same story repeated at least three times, where you get all kinds of different information in that and um, uh, the different perspectives of the three women. Um, so I wanted to look at how these different forms of narrative interact with the, the novel form in particular. Um, but also not to forget the role of 
non things that we think of as not being narrative, right? So uh, the songs, which are not always non-narrative. Like in uh, in Hashili Bake Robokata, there are many songs of which most of them are either chora, which is a kind of rhyme, uh, or panchali, uh, and also um, a sort of local form called kedugan, which is a um, really a platform for social commentary, um, where the, the, the spontaneous compositions will uh, talk about local events, talk about even um, global events like uh, the World War, and um, they'll weave these commentaries into these little songs. So, um, the, uh, sorry, I just realized I should not totally have no idea what time it is. Um, <laughs> okay, so one other thing that needs to be discussed is the role of the folk. So when, uh, when we're talking about socio-regional dialects um, and these songs that are coming into novels. Um, these would mostly, uh, you know, be, you can uh, learn uh, most about them by looking at folklore studies, right? But so the, the word lok, which is used in folklore studies, I was struck by this poem from the 17th century, actually, which, um, which makes a comment about the performative power of folk language. It says, Lokik bolia na koriho bohase, Lokik monta ki sapir bisnasi. So you shouldn't laugh at my language, which in this case is Bangla as opposed to Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. This is the 17th century. But um, it does what it needs to do, it has uh, the power that it needs to have. Um, so I put this with the pictures of these book covers because this is uh, another author, Ma Monoj Boshu, who wrote about the Shundorbot in the uh, in the uh, like southern part of Bengal, where the the um, the sun how do you say it in English? Sun Sundarbans. Sundarbans. Yeah, the Sundarbans. I think Bob has been there recently. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he writes a lot about the the. Um, Having the local knowledge in one's, <coughs> the, it's a common phrase, but like in the mirrors of the fingernails, knock door bunny. If you if you know like you know it like the back of your hand, right? So um, so the use of the uh, the dialects in the uh, novels often conveys just bodies of knowledge that are not accessible, right? Without that um, without that language. So interestingly, in the um, in the 1970s, you have a body of poetry coming out of the western part of West Bengal in a place called Rar, which is a region of western West Bengal, um, which um, is staking a claim to indigeneity and to the Bangla language as um, not being something separate from or uh, you know, obviously better than the uh, indigenous of roots, but actually um, that it is our own, that our language is Bangla, that you, it, it is not a sub-language, it's, um, it's not a sub variety, right? So this poem by Philippe Bawi, um, I wasn't able to check out the book again and get the original, but the title at least I have, Ito Omar Mayer Pasha, this is my mother's language. So this is the, um, the Rar dialect, he's saying, you know, uh, again, like, don't laugh at our language um, because there's magic in this language. <coughs> and it's my mother's language. It's just the Bangla language. So I wanted to emphasize my, right, because it's not the mother tongue, right? Matri Pasha, right? It's not the, uh, the abstract con uh, construction of the mother that is associated with nationalism, right? This is ma uh, my mother. Who um, who taught me this language, which is not uh, you know which which is Bangla. So this is a claim that I found interesting, which is sort of a this this, this regional poetry from Rar is actually a predecessor to the Bangla Dalit literature movement, mm -hmm. which um, kind of took off in the 1990s. Um, the, so moving backwards a little bit, alongside this claim to indigeneity. Um, you have the 
language of the refugees, right? So um, the partition of, India, of uh, Bengal resulted in a lot of people coming from East Bengal to West Bengal, um, as well as the other way around. So you have um, the East Bengali dialects carrying a particular resonance in, um, in literature, mostly in prose, um, such as Odin Moldavada's Niu Kontra Paki Koje, which I, I, uh, I discovered was very popular in Tamil translation, which I found very fascinating because it's a dialect novel, it's a regional novel, it has a lot of, it's just loaded with, um, with detail about, um, about the region and the people and the local life, but was extremely popular with uh, Tamil writers at the time um, who read it in, uh, uh, in translation. Um, and a lot of these books were actually circulating in local libraries. So um, they, were, they were widely available at the time. Um, the other one is Agun Paki. This one is actually written um, in, the, in one of the Rar dialects, the dialect of Ortaman. Um, but uh, you know, the author is, uh, uh, is now Bangladeshi. Um, so you have this happening on uh, on in both directions. Um, so here again, the the language has to do with dwelling, with habitation, right? So on the one hand, you have uh, the idea of Adi Bas, the being the uh, original dwellers in a land. Like, like this is our land. You you can't put us down, right? On the other hand, you have um, the language of the refugee, right, which invokes this immense loss and and. Um, dislocation um, coming in as well. So, um, so the idea of of dwelling and habitation, I think, is very important in thinking about um, the role that like that language plays, that like linguistic diversity plays in um, in literature. And um, I also kind of uh, found. Uh, some other scholarship on the on the idea of um, of habitation to be problematic, so we can talk about that later if anybody's curious. Um, so <coughs> this one is a little magazine. Um, uh, the editor is uh, Polani Taku, who's a prominent um, Bengali Dalit writer uh, now, living now. Um, is called Nir, which means nest. So you can see the graphic is kind of like made to look like a tree. Right, um, and this is the the special issue on refugees or ubastu. Um, so, the poem that I have here is um, by uh, Bijoy Sharkar, who is a, a kobi. Um, so this is a form that's called poet songs, which is has been like widely maligned in um, in especially in Bangla language scholarship for being like this obscene product of 19th century Kal Kalkara Bab Babu culture and it's like so horrible and we're so glad we're modern now and we don't have to think about it. But actually in the in the, the Dalit literature movement, um, there's been an emphasis on uh, who will on this form um, because it was related to the um, the Motua movement in uh, Kuripur and in uh, sort of Southern East Bengal. Um, which, uh, which was a really important predecessor to the Dalit movement um, because it, uh, uh, it, uh, it came out of the Nongshudra community who, um, who agitated for, um, for, uh, for their, their rights in as far back as the colonial period. Um, and so Vijay Sharkar is one of the well-known Hobbies who um, was from, I think, Narayil in East Bengal, and he, um, he ended up in West Bengal later. But so this form, which is uh, sort of associated with the, the, the decadent Babu culture in literary studies is actually um, a thriving form, um, still practiced today, and uh, has a really important historical significance for the Dalit community. Um, and uh, so this poem is about the partition, as you can see, uh, talking about the Dalit refugees who did not find a place in West Bengal. They were sent to all kinds of places, including uh, Dondokarunno, which has a very 
um, negative mythological connotation, as well as the Andamans, which are, were a penal colony, and um, other places. Um, so you have that. So I realize that I'm probably talking way too much about Brahma, so let's move on to Tamil. Um, these are some crows on the Pondicherry beach, because um, in Tamil also you have the word kada. Okay, so this is the same word, right? Gotha, uh, gada. Um, but what I ended up emphasizing in my uh, in looking at uh, contemporary Tamil writers, living Tamil writers now who are using dialect in their work, um, is the um, the way that I um, I understand them to see dialect as a mode of attention. So in Tamil, attention is kavadam. Uh, and these crows are here because one of the writers that I worked with and got a chance to meet was um, Karmani Gunasegan, who has often compared the role of the writer to that of a crow, where the crow is just sitting there on a branch, you know, whatever, minding its business, looking around, and then it sees something tasty like this fish, and suddenly it's, uh, you know, it like tilts its head and looks very keenly at that object. Um, so he feels that the, the writer's job is also like that, to, um, to listen attentively and to, um, to collect those things which are, being, are not being told, the voices that aren't being heard, the stories that haven't been told, and to, uh, to incorporate those in his writing. So, uh, so he's one writer who has a very vocal, open, ethical commitment to writing in dialect. Um, and here is a picture of his home region, uh, which is not a very good picture, but it has, um, you can see the red earth. So the different um, towns in his work are associated with different uh, colors of earth. The, the red earth region is where they produce cashews. So that's a cashew fruit and a cashew nut. Um, and in Tamil, you have an expression for dialect, which is called Bhattaravarakit. So this means the loosely like the practice or the custom of a region or vataram. So varaka being a uh, custom or practice, right? So um, so again, it's very important to think about space, about the way that um, that language relates to space, right? So uh, I have some terms glossed here. Okay, so naga is, is the Tamil equivalent of dish, r roughly, right? Um, the region that uh, this author, Karmani Gunasegaran, comes from is called Nadu Nadu, which is the region in the middle. <laughs> I don't know what it's in the middle of in, in, um, in their understanding, but it, it's like in the middle of Chennai and Pondicherry, I guess. But, um, but it's called the middle region, and um, it's like roughly around Virulachalam district. Um, so the localities that are really important in, um, in his work are the Ur, which is a town. So this is, a, again, a very common, ordinary Tamil word, nothing fancy. Um, but it has so many layers of, of um, significance um, because it's not just a town, it's also a community, it's also a bifurcated uh, space where you have the Ur and you have the Cheri, which is the Dalit uh, neighborhood, which each have their own streets and uh, so on. And um, these are also connected by the Chale, so it's interestingly, uh, this author is a peanut and cashew farmer in his ancestral village of Manakole, and he is also a mechanic with the State Transport Corporation, also known as Periyar, um, in Rulachalam district. So he's written also about the, um, the transport corporation, <coughs> the bus drivers and bus conductors and uh, mechanics who work there, um, also bringing in the regional dialect. So, um, What's interesting about that is the difference in the reception of dialect literature in Bangla and Tamil is also something to note. So in, uh, if you read reviews of, uh, of uh, Tamil dialect writing, which is becoming more and more, um, uh, more, more and more of it is becoming available, um, you get reviews saying that it's like torture. You get editors like correcting things to the standard dialect. And um, I really liked one review that I read um, 
where the, the reader just could not get through this novel of Pragmanis, the Gunas Agarans, called Angele, and he just kept like, okay, I read two pages, I put it down, I like, couldn't get through it. And then finally, told, uh, uh, they told themselves, Thamir Dane, it's Thamil after all, I, I can do this, and they read it and they liked it. <laughs> and they wrote a good review. I was like, okay, this is very interesting. So um, this is just a sort of a random page of my notes. I'm trying to translate Angele at, uh, at the moment. And um, it is full of dialect words, as you can see. So a lot of Tamil writers, contemporary Tamil writers, have created dictionaries to go along with their works of their local dialect. Um, so there's a sort of uh, trend of amateur le lexicography on the part of the authors, um, which uh, is another really interesting feature um, of Tamil dialect writing in particular. Um, but there's a these these sort of pol politics behind it, I guess, in Karnmani's case at least, is um, is a feeling of necessity that it has to be there, that I can't use any other word because this word needs to be heard, to be read, or to be listened to. Right? So um, uh, the, the same novel has actually been kind of like, not, uh, not criticized in a negative sense, but the um, Vargita who wrote the introduction to the novel has said like, oh, you know, there's no one in the novel who talks about um, Dalit politics, who talks about, you know, injustice or so on. But, um, but actually that is there in a different way. It's there in the, di in the use of dialect. It's there in the way that the character thinks about uh, the forms that she encounters. Like she's seeing a lullaby um, to her daughter. And uh, she suddenly stops and thinks like, why am I seeing this lullaby? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't match my life. And she has this moment of, um, uh, you know, where she's she's thinking um, about the uh, about this song. So there's um, there's many instances like that. Uh, but actually, I'm going to kind of mix up these slides a little bit because the other form that's really important in contemporary Tamil literature is the upadi. So this is a lament form, and um, I actually wrote a paper about it for Lawrence a long time ago because. Um, <laughs> we were reading Anand Pandian's work about Opari in, uh, in, uh, in a different region of Tamil Nadu. And um, this is usually a woman's form of lament. It can be, in, no in uh, novels in particular, you often see it just kind of uh, as a sort of spontaneous outburst of feeling, almost like the way a film song works. But um, it's uh, often performed collectively where the women of the community or the neighborhood or village would, would uh, get together and, um, and uh, sing together, right? So one woman will start and then another one will start and then they'll, they'll sort of pass them around. Um, it's even been used in, uh, uh, I saw some like, news thing about um, using opari as a kind of form of political resistance. But um, so this, particular one comes from Thomas Ali's novel, Al Alam. So um, Sue Thomas Ali is a, another living uh, Tamil writer from, uh, from a different region called Tiruvarur, but she actually lives in Virulatulam now. Um, and she's also an educator. Um, so I wanted to include an example of a party so you can see the structure, right? It's based on an incongruence, right? Of like what I expected and what happened um, or what's beautiful and what's happened to me that's, uh, you know, distressing, etc. So it says, Alli konamarinji yenna adarika yadamin that kottiyum tamariyum Oh, I'm missing a line here, sorry. I, I miscopied it. Anyway, kottiyum tamariyum kolotarachi putalum kotti konamarinji yenna kondanaipa yadamin that there's, I, there's this beautiful profusion of flowers, right? But there's no one to share it with me. Um, so this is the kind of uh, central structure of feeling of the opari, which uh, you see again and again in all the different uh, oparis, which are very widely used in um, in dialect uh, novels. Carmen um, Yunusagan has actually apparently written one for a film. I just learned um, there was like a, I think a 2015 double film that uh, he composed in opari for the film. Um, so he's one of the rare male performers of opari in. Uh, 
that I know of in Tamil Nadu. I know in Sri Lanka there are some forms of opari which are performed by men. But um, but in, in as far as I know, in Tamil Nadu it's mostly women. But he writes opari as well as other. Um, he actually started out writing uh, wedding invitations and like um, you know rhymes. You know those kind of social poetry. So um, so he has that kind of. Um, uh, those kind of forms available to him. Uh, so, what is interesting about Opari in a dialect novel? Well, uh, not only because it's, uh, it might contain some dialect, but also um, the way that uh, that it's cast in, in Thelma Sylvie's work in particular as um, a form of women's bonding, um, which is not always, um, doesn't always work. <laughs> There's a scene in one of her novels, Kachari, where uh, the, the women of the community have got together to sing a party together on the occasion of a death, and then um, the main character is being totally sidelined by her mother-in-law, and um, who's trying to like send her back home and won't let her stay. And the other women are protesting, like, no, she's come to sing opari, she should do her part and she should sing. And um, so there's this kind of altercation there. Um, but uh, Dama Selvi's work is she uh, she characterizes it herself as being uh, stories of women's struggles, Bengalin Boratam. So uh, she, we can say, is a self-styled feminist writer. Um, but what I argue in relation to her work is that the strength and the power of her feminism actually comes out of this very intimate um, uh, exploration of local practice and language, which, um, which actually ranges across multiple regions. Um, her, her work moves a little more than Karmani's work does, uh, which is very rooted in one uh, district. So uh, her characters move around, but what I want to emphasize again, as, as I did with the, um, the Bengali uh, partition literature, is that um, there's a sense of uh, local language not being some kind of inherited birthright, but something that you have to actually learn and um, make your own and build. You have to build a home and a community, right? Because um, uh, with, uh, with, with almost all these characters, um, uh, they're mostly women who are uprooted routinely, you know, as, as, as patrilocal um, custom, right? So the, the word that she uses a lot is actually literally to be subject to life in your husband's town. Barke so she, uh, So the, the women in her stories are finding strength and um, creativity in new environments. Uh, so the, so the, the dialect takes on a particular um, valence, I, th I think, in her work, as well as the, um, just the thick detail of local practices. So when you talk about dialect, it's like a language thing, right? But it actually comes out of practice. Um, as uh, uh, there's a, an article by uh, by one of our friends in Pondicherry, uh, who uh, is a historian of science and mathematics, but actually he wrote about um, dialects in practice, the way that um, you know people measure things, right? Um, it varies on different levels. So. Um, I, what did I skip? Oh, yeah, play. So, but I got it in general. Um, this is an excellent discussion about a louse, which um, knows where the ocean is and doesn't want to go there because it will drown. So, <laughs> the, the reason I liked this passage is because these women have just come home from an exhausting day's work in the salt flats, um, harvesting salt. And, um, and they're playing with a louse. They just can't get over how, how fascinating it is that this louse will not go to the ocean. And so um, you have this moment of play. So the element of play is really strong in, uh, in Thelma Sully's work. I actually ended up kind of just tracking all the, these moments of play. Um, and the other form that's important in the work of both authors is Vasanga or Vasanga. There's different dialectal uh, you know, names for this, but it's curses, right? So this is something you see in uh, in uh, in Hashemi Bagheera Bokata also, where he, uh, the the Bengali novel that I was talking about earlier, where 
the, um, there's a very particular form of curses. Um, so again, the, uh, the performative element here is something that really needs to be paid attention to. Um, and no one is telling me how much time I have left, so I'm just, I just keep talking. Um, <laughs> what, no, how much time it's, it's I have? It's 5.55, so maybe it yeah. uh, depends on 15 minutes, then you'll have time for some kind of for questions. Okay, for yeah, I'm on my last slide, but I was just okay. not wanting to rush through if I have a lot of time. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to conclude with um, these couple of quotes uh, because I think that's something that I didn't really do in the dissertation, but which is really important to the way that I see these works is um, is the the materiality of them. Uh, there's this quote from Thomas Salvi who. Um, who went to a school called uh, Guru Kolam in uh, in, uh, in and it had a printing press, right? She, so she's talking about how she used to like filch the books from the printing press and sew them into her school books to read them. And this is how she encountered a lot of um, you know works that were important to her as a young writer. And she uh, also yeah. talks about reading a lot of Bengali translations and um, and just other uh, world literature as well. Um, and then the quote which I ended up using for my, for, uh, in the, to excuse myself for my choice of texts is, uh, again from Jiro the Das, I bought a few books on the authority of my own mind. The character says like, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't look at the reviews or anything or ask anyone who's knowledgeable. I just kind of, uh, chose these books, right, at a, old, a used bookstore. Um, so I had, I felt like I had to just choose texts that I loved for this, um, uh, work because there are too many of them that I could have otherwise talked about and, um, I'm a close reader, so I can't read all of them closely, right? That would be many dissertations. Um, so, but just to think a little bit about how, um, these works are, um, are not only paying close attention, intimate attention to the material cultures of the um, regions and communities that the dialects are coming out of, but also that they have a material life of their own um, and, uh, and how they circulate in the communities is also interesting. In the case of living writers like Donald Sovi and Kanmi Lanzaga, they've had to like read their work out loud. But, like, you, know, you, <laughs> you go down the street and your neighbor is reading your novel to the other neighbors because they want to know when they come into the novel. And um, uh, so there's a there's a sort of a life beyond the uh, the text that is also important to think about um, when we're thinking about um, orality in literature. Um, so I feel like I kind of rushed through a lot of things. So I'm sure you will have questions, but um, I will conclude on that note and let you ask me questions. Yes. Okay, so thank you. Very interesting, especially the comparative things. I had a question, just a kind of linguistic question. Now, yes. li just looking at the um, the dialect passages you showed mm -hmm. uh, from uh, yeah. Bangla. So it, it looks like, you know, as far as I can see, the the uh, Basha is rather different from the Shadu Basha. Right. But yet, it, it's the vocabulary seems still very Sanskritic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I was wondering, is there a, is there a Corpus of a kind of desha shobda, so to speak, like local words that are not from there. I know many of true. like maybe local, yeah. like birds mm -hmm. and plants and things, but is there a large vocabulary of kind of mm -hmm. desha words, you know, that are not uh, of Sanskritic origin? Well, I mean, it, it varies from dialect to dialect. Uh -huh. um, there are some dialects which have a lot more Persian and Arabic vocabulary. Yeah, that's what I was um, You know, but it depends on the dialect as well as the community that the speaker or the writer comes from. <coughs> but um, the uh, the standard Bangla is pretty Sanskritic across all regions. Mm. Um, so the degree to which a dialect, you know, a passage in dialect is actually very different from the standard 
varies a lot, right? Because it depends on some of the spoken dialects are closer to um, uh, to Cholit Pasha, to the kind of modern standard, um, and some are much farther away, right? So um, there's a degree of distance even there. But a lot of times when you're looking at sort of cursorily at the dialect, uh, it might not look that different, but if you start looking really closely, then you'll find all kinds of things because there's little tiny things like onomatopoeia. Okay, there's another um, poem that I didn't quote here, which, um, which is talking about a harrow. And it says something, uh, you know, about uh, our bodies being like hunhunda uh, harrows. I have no idea what that means, right? Because it's an onomatopoeia for something that I don't have experience with. Okay, I've never handled a harrow. So um, there's things that seem small, but actually are these like worlds that you have no access to except through those little words. Um, and also sometimes the usage of a word will be di different in the different dialects. So it, it might look like the same word, right. but it's actually used differently. Right. Bermuda Murugan uh, has uh, pointed that out a lot in his work, mm -hmm. where you know um, <laughs> he has a very funny story about translating a book of his that's about uh, sheep herders, and the translator, who's a native Tamil speaker, consistently translated as goat every time, or maybe it's the other way around. But so the goat and the sheep got confused, right? Because he mm -hmm. was using a local. It made total sense to him, but if to the translator, it wasn't clear whether it was a sheep or a goat. Similarly, the word gade, gade is a forest mm -hmm. or a field, like an agricultural field. Um, so you have to know who, where you are when you're translating that word, um, you know, um, and not make put forests in the place of the fields, right? It, um, so it's things like that. So when dialect gets literarized, so to speak, okay. now put into books and yeah. you know, so on, so does it get changed? Are the writers sort of norming it in a certain way for things that are a little bit out of the norm that their readers won't understand? Because I, I understood you mm -hmm. to say that some of these writers actually are <coughs> providing glosses right. within, like sort mm -hmm. of like, Sanskrit chayas of Prakrit lines in a play. In other words, yeah. you have the original, but then you, you right. assume your audience won't understand mm -hmm. it, so you kind of gloss it. Yeah. yeah, well, there's a wide variety of different approaches. Some use a paratext, right? Some use uh, footnotes um, or endnotes or glossary. Mm. Separate dictionaries, right, have been mm. produced by a lot of writers. Um, or there's a sort of an in, tr in text, like the Hashali Waka Rupapata has this tick where the narrator keeps saying, or tat. So this meaning. meaning so uh, Benjamin Byer, who translated that novel, has written about that. Um, but so there's a wide variety of different approaches. And what I found was interesting in con comparing and contrasting, I guess, um, Bengali and Tamil is that in, uh, in Tamil, there's this strong discourse of unintelligibility of the dialect. Like, we don't know what you're talking about. How can you write in this language? Um, even though, you know, I mean, as a non-native speaker, I feel like that it's not really any harder than reading any other book, but, um, <laughs> um, but you know, that's, that's me. Um, whereas in Bangla, I have not seen that kind of discourse, right? There may be, like, oh, you know, maybe why do we need to write in dialects, but not so much that, oh, we can't understand it, right? So um, I felt that what Hashali Bakir Rupala is doing is actually calling that out and saying, no, you can't understand this. Because the dialect that's used there is actually not very different from the standard. Um, not so much, I'm not saying that the real spoken language isn't different, but that the representation is not that different. It's orthographic mainly. It's a spelling difference. So, um, so that was a very deliberate ploy on the, the author's part to say, hey, <laughs> pay attention to this, which is not, you know, not the same. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is so fabulous. Um, you mentioned um, how um, people see Tamil and Bangla as not in conversation with each other, but mm -hmm. you saw that they um, they spoke to each other on mm -hmm. different levels. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit. On yeah. That. So I um, I didn't really end up uh, focusing much on the actual history of translation in my work, but um, but there is right there. It has been a lot of contact for a long time since the 19th century. Um, uh, in the modernist period, there were translations around, um, and you know these living authors that I talked to kind of like 
uh, not not grew up exactly, but like when they were young writers, they were reading a lot of Bengali literature um, in Tamil, which was available in the library. So there is a history of contact. Um, there's a one translator in particular who lived in Kolkata was a native Tamil speaker. He translated a lot of stuff in both directions. Uh, Krishna, I think it's Su, Krishna Murthy. Um So he unfortunately passed away before I got a chance to go pick his brain. But um, <laughs> but so there there is that real real record of of, of interaction. But also um, I think that it's easy to get stuck on the linguistic barrier and not think about ways that there might be commonalities beyond that. Um, there are a lot of really obvious differences um, in terms of like, you know, the, the kind of massive impact of partition obviously is not felt in the same way as in Tamil. So the relationship between language and place is not really the same. Although since I have a background in translating Sri Lankan stuff, you know, I mean, that it is very much there in, in the case of Sri Lanka. Um, so, I, uh, you know, I haven't really, I need to do more research on that, but, um, but yeah, so, uh, so that's what I was going for. It's also, it's like, you know, we got the East Coast thing going on, it's like, there's, there's more to it than just the language family. Um, okay. I'd be curious, um, if you could just say more about, um, like, maybe venturing into sort of a more speculative around why, um, people receive the, the Tamil dialects as unintelligible mm -hmm. and, and the Bengali ones as, as, as intelligible or like, yeah, like how do we understand that culturally? Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that uh, might make it easier to understand is that Tamil is diglossic. So the written language is still very separate from the spoken language. Um, and one thing uh, that I wrote about and talked about is um, the use of spoken Tamil in mm -hmm. writing, which is becoming more popular. Um, which is not necessarily heavily dialectal uh, language, but it's a representation of speech. Um, so you'll have, you know, there's like a, there's a, re a recent novel uh, by Imam called Yenka, that, which means my story. And it's, narr the entire book is in spoken Tamil, right? So the, there, there, it's not a conventionalized literary medium yet. It, who knows, maybe someday it will become one, but, uh, uh, but it's not right. So in Bangla, you don't you have uh, a, a a variety called oh, oh well, I mean I don't know if it's still really called that now, but Jolien Pasha, which replaced the older literary mm -hmm. standard, which was Shadu um, Basha. So a, a more formal kind of literary language was replaced by a more colloquial one. So, but it's been freed of the burden of being a representation of speech, right? It's a it's a modern prose form. So. Um, so the absence of that in th in Tamil actually almost seem doesn't seem to be any barrier to using dialect. I mean, dialect needs to be more used in Tamil than in Bangla. Um, but there is more um, debate around wh uh, <coughs> what <laughs> I don't know how you can code switch. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, what is okay to cross over and what is um, <coughs> sloppy? There's a lot of sort of editorial debate about that. Um, does that answer your question at all? I mean, yeah, yeah um, it just, I mean, it's, yeah, it's really complicated. Like, yeah. If there's <laughs> something, if you wanted to make an essentializing claim about, um, <laughs> you know, of Tamilness and its claims to purity or, or something, like, you know, uh, uh, I'd just be, or I don't know. Yeah, but like no, I mean, I don't <laughs> want to go in that direction, <laughs> right? Um, I think that there's been a lot written about Tamil language nationalism and not enough mm -hmm. about Tamil literature. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to make that kind of a claim, but um, but it's just a different literary culture, you know. I mean, uh, but a very active and diverse and vibrant one, where uh, you know anyone can be a writer. If you look at a list of Tamil writers, you know, like there's a, a an anthology of short stories and that's been published in translation, mm -hmm. edited by Dilip Kumar. Mm -hmm. uh, um, he makes a comment about how, you know, if you look at the list of authors in the back, like they they all have different occupations and professions. Like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of diversity in contemporary film literature, um, which I mean, not to say that there isn't in Bangla, but uh, but just that that's a feature of the literary scene. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Bangla, the use of dialect has 
gone down, I would say, since the modernist period. It's coming back in certain experimental ways. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are there distinct movements? I mean, the regionalist movement, <coughs> like uh -huh. Angelic movement in Hindi literature, yeah. like Panish Varakri and those yeah. guys, so they were distinctly going away from the centers, mm -hmm. uh, the, the urban yeah. centers, and writing like the people or something like that. Right. I mean, the Vardarka Varka, the Vardarka Varka was actually a literary movement for a while. Mm -hmm. It's not really known that way anymore. Uh, like, you don't use the phrase Vardarka Varka Ilakium as like a separate thing, but it was. So um, y there was a, a, a writer called Kira who was... Um, who is known for sort of breaking barriers between different languages, but also like some people hate him and some people love him kind of thing. But um, he led a little mini movement of writers from a certain region called Garisal in, in Dalai Nadu and um, that kind of was uh, catalyzed it for a while. But even before that, in the modern, like in the late modernist period, um, there was a writer, um, uh, Shan Mukasundra, who wrote a, um, a novel called Nagoman, which is considered the first dialect novel mm -hmm. in Tamil, because it was really invested in the material culture of the region, not only sort of using a uh, dialect as a kind of like local color or like a uh, character thing, it was uh, more rooted in the place. So that's considered the first one, like 1941. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. First, thank you. And, uh, so um, this is sort of an extension of, of Ned's question, and we're thinking about the different literary cultures. It, it, uh, in each side of the paper, there's a moment where someone expresses as a kind of recognition. Mm -hmm. So in the first one, it is my mother's language. It is Bangla. Mm -hmm. And the second, um, uh, it is Tamil after all. So in both cases, there's, I'm just wondering, but, you, but in very different as you pointed out, literary cultures, and I'm just sort of just very struck by the, the kind of work that moments of recognition does. Or yeah, um, I mean, it can do all kinds of different work, right? I mean, uh, it's doing different things in the two examples, um, but it's a kind of a thing where if you see dialect on a page, right, there's a wide range of responses you can have to that. Sometimes it's like, oh, they're talking like me. Sometimes it's like, what? That's not how we talk. <laughs> And sometimes it could be like, that's not right, you know, that's not how you're supposed to write, right? So um, there's, I don't know, the response really varies in both languages. So I don't think I can make a blanket statement. Um, but, you know, partly because of the diglossia issue and partly, uh, you know, for the just the different political history of the two regions, you know, I mean, in terms of language politics, like it's just, um, you know, I don't know if I can summarize it in... Well, uh, to the extent, it, yeah. is it, uh, I'm not a literary scholar, <laughs> but it, the one text I think when I think about heteroglossic text is, is Bhakti and on the uh -huh. 19th century European novel, where, yeah. where <coughs> there's something about the state of affairs in which the question of dialect becomes central mm -hmm. to representing the nation in a different, in a city in a different kind of way mm -hmm. than earlier. And there isn't necessarily this more than pressure to have a single. But it's so there's yeah. a certain kind of story about about modernity and, and heteroglossia, but mm -hmm. th that's yeah, not the well kind of story that that, that like does in either case. There's an anthropological history, mm -hmm. and they know there's a yeah. yeah. I mean, the 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 interesting thing about Bakhtin is he doesn't want to talk about dialect. He wants to talk about the expressive possibilities, right? So, which I I mean I I love Bakhtin. I read I read Bakhtin pretty intensively before I wrote this, but um, but I actually wanted to look at the socio-regionally marked, linguistically marked dialects, which he kind of doesn't really want to address, because his project is totally different from mine, obviously. But um, so the what he says about dialect is that it's, um, it's, a, it's a closed socio-linguistic uh, system, which is then deformed the literary language and the literary language is deformed by it and there's this all kind of permeability kind of thing, which is uh, it's definitely I'm not making a case against that, but uh, simply sort of trying to focus on the um, on the importance of understanding like how regionality works um, as not just like a 
uh, not just a, a backdrop or like a, a source of or a place of origin, but actually doing so many different things and all these different types. So that's why I have trouble talking about my dissertation because it's about too many different things, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so I hope it wasn't too confusing dealing with two languages and everything. But um, yeah, if that answers your question at all. It does. Do you have one last question? Okay. Uh, such a great talk, thanks. So I just had a question which kind of follows from uh, Ned's as well as um, Lawrence's, where I think you made this very great point about dialect, you know, uh, having a link with identity of a place mm -hmm. and a sort of a culture as well. Mm -hmm. But I think there, there was a moment in specifically Tamil literary cultures or history where dialect becomes political, mm -hmm. right? So it is about... Uh, bringing a totally new um, kind of representation mm -hmm. into the fore, which was aligned with the Dalit movement. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's just so interesting how um, you had people like, you know, Nagamal, the, mm -hmm. the author of Nagamal, and then Pudumai Pitten, who also right. writes in dialect, mm -hmm. but no one really pays the, uh, a kind of... Right. Um, almost, you know, saying, uh, we can't read this, like <laughs> in the way, you yeah. know, they say about writers that you've mentioned. And I think um, just in terms of, of nationalism that you brought out as well, perhaps there's also the link between, you know, writing in high uh, Tamil, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with like just thinking of Barney Bates' work, right. you know, through that. Um, and then you have this parallelly, this rise of, um, dialect mm -hmm. in modern Tamil literature, which can, I think, really shed light on uh, a certain kind of politics, mm -hmm. which I think yeah. is continually evolving now with the success of Peramal Murugan mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the wide kind of translation right. that he's uh, really been given access to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that it's is a interesting. I don't think it's a, it's yeah. a question. Yeah. No, but yeah. Um, uh, no, it's absolutely. It's <coughs> definitely <coughs> political. Um, I kind of, uh, I'm actually going, yeah, my next research is more specifically on Dalit literature. Like I wrote mm -hmm. some on Dalit literature in the dissertation, but it wasn't the only focus. Um, but, uh, but I'm interested in thinking more, hard, hard more harder <laughs> about, um, about the role of, of, uh, of Dalit and Dalit literature, because I think it's something that's often kind of overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Bangla, particularly in Dhamma, uh, you have um, you know writers making pretty vocal statements about it, like mm -hmm. Bama being sort of questioned for her use of, of colloquial Dhamma and and, uh, and in some cases dialectal and, and just being like, well, why not? Like I, you know, this is how I wanna. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, you know differences between the two languages, but I do think that um, uh, yeah, I'd like to explore that more. Uh, in my further research. Is yeah, like even Ba, I mean, um, Salma, right, who's right. a Muslim uh -huh. uh, Tamil <laughs> writer, yeah. she has a glossary at the back, uh -huh. and that's, yeah. I mean, it's just Muslim Tamil writing, it's usually glossed right. under that, so I I just think that that's kind of interesting when you look at sort of minority literature yeah. within uh -huh. Tamil. Yeah. Right, thank yeah. you. So before we thank you formally, we <laughs> have to give you the ritual welcome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> <it's the laughs> study for you I've never been. So it's, um, which is the bag. bag. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> and after we thank uh, Dr. Whittington, please join us outside for further conversation. <laughs>